Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research Educational Webinar, Ask the Experts. Thank you for joining, uh, joining us for one of our fan favorites, our Ask the Experts session. I'm Manny Lozano, the Senior Director of Global Patient Programs here at FSR. Uh, the moderator for the session. But before we start, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. As a reminder, this session is being recorded. Attendees will be muted throughout the event, so please submit your questions via the chat feature. Please try to be as broad as possible when asking your questions. We know how unique sarcoidosis is, but it's important to note that our experts is, are not able to provide direct medical advice. We will use some of the questions that were submitted during the registration process as well as some of the questions asked during our live event. We may not be able to get to all of the questions, but we promise that we will do our best to ask as many questions as possible. We are honored to introduce our two experts for today's session. Our cardiology expert, Dr. Jordana Crone of Virginia Commonwealth University Multidisciplinary Sarcoidosis Clinic, a founding member of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance. Also joining us is a rheumatology expert, Dr. Jenna Braverman of the Hospital for Special Surgery, New York Presbyterian Wheel Cornell Medicine, founding member of the FSR Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance. Dr. Crone graduated mag magna cum laude from Princeton University with a major in chemistry and went to medical school at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, where she also completed an internal medicine residency and she completed a fellowship in cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology at the University of Florida. She joined faculty as a clinical cardiac electrophysiologist at Virginia Commonwealth University in 2008, where she was the program director for the electrophysiology fellowship program from 2013 to 2017, and an associate professor, professor since 2015 and professor since 2021. She is a founding member of the VCU Sarcoidosis Clinic. Her primary research interest is cardiac sarcoidosis. She served on the writing committee for the HRS expert consent consensus statement on the management of arrhythmias associated with cardiac sarcoidosis and was the section leader for management of art, art, atrial arrhythmias, excuse me, and conduction of systemic disease in patients with cardiac sarcoidosis. She is a founding member of the Cardiac Sarcoidosis Consortium and International Collaborative Research Group committed to furthering the understanding of cardiac sarcoidosis. Welcome, Dr. Crone. Thank you so uh, much. Happy to be here. Dr. Jenna, Jenna Braverman, Braverman is a senior rheumatology fellow at the Hospital for Special Surgery, New York Presbyterian Will Cornell Medicine in New York City where she is also currently completing a master's degree in clinical and trans translational science through the Wheel Cornell Medicine Clinical and Translational Science Center. After completion of her fellowship training, she will join the Hospital for Special Surgery Rheumatology faculty. Dr. Braverman has a particular interest in the cardiopulmonary manifestations of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases and is especially committed to advancing patient care and research on sarcoidosis. She is thrilled to be involved with the Foundation for Sarcoidosis Research as, a, as well as a member of the Hospital for Special Surgery Sarcoidosis Collaborative. Welcome, Dr. Crow. Hi, thank you all so much for having me. Well, awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining. I am going to stop sharing this screen here and we will kick things off by asking our first question of the evening. So please bear with us. Let me just go ahead and move a little thing out the way. All right, perfect. So the first question is for you, Dr. Braverman. Um, um, and we wanted to know, um, what advice um, do you have for, um, you know, helping someone deal with adrenal insufficiency where, uh, that you know, is resulting from a high dose of prednisone therapy? Yeah, so I think that this comes up very, very frequently in rheumatology. Um, you know, steroids are sort of our um, best worst medicine in some ways. Um, you know, they work really quickly to help control inflammation and get control of many symptoms. Um, but there are many, many, many side effects. And I think you can think of an organ system and there is a side effect from corticosteroids. 
And even though, um, you know, classically, we may think of adrenal insufficiency developing after prolonged periods of taking steroids at higher doses, really there's data that shows that even lower doses, as low as, you know, less than five milligrams of prednisone or prednisone equivalent um, can lead to adrenal insufficiency. And so I think there are, um, you know, a lot of, you know, this is, this is something that's going to be a partnership with your treating physician um, as you are attempting um, to manage your steroids. So I think that one thing, you know, it, it's really important to talk to your physician about symptoms that you're having. Um, I think it's important to understand what is adrenal insufficiency versus what may be underlying sarcoid uh, right. symptoms or other medical issues that need attention. So I think that that's a really important um, factor. And then I think it's a, it's really critical to take into account, have there been recent dose changes? Are you tapering? Are you trying to come down on the steroids? Is the taper too fast or is the tempo, uh, does that need to be adjusted? Um, and so I think, you know, it is really important if you are adrenally insufficient that you, do, you know, you talk to your doctor about how you're feeling because you don't want to stop steroids cold turkey because your body is 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 dependent on them for sort of blood pressure maintenance um, and a lot of its critical functions. So I think that that is really going to be um, you know a, a partnership with your doctor about how you can manage the symptoms um, because your your medications may need to be adjusted. Thank you for that, Dr. Braverman. Um, that was a great answer to that question. And we are going to ask a question of you, Dr. Crone. Um, so we get this question a lot um, in the community and. Um, we just wanted to know if you could provide a little, enlighten us a little more on what are the major effects of sarcoidosis in the heart or cardiology sarcoidosis as it, it's more often referred to? Okay, great question. So sarcoidosis most commonly affects the lungs. More than 90% of patients have lung involvement, but it can affect so many other organ systems. We now know as we've learned more that probably up to 25% of people that have sarcoidosis have cardiac involvement. Uh, and of course, I think the heart's the most important organ system, but it really is important if you have sarcoidosis in the heart because it can cause some very dangerous rhythm problems and can lead to heart failure. So if it's in the heart, we really wanna know about it and make sure that we are addressing it. So um, in terms of screening, our guidelines recommend that every patient with sarcoid in any organ system should at least be screened for cardiac involvement. And that can be very simple. That can be asking about symptoms of palpitations, passing out or feeling like you're gonna pass out, getting an electrocardiogram where they put the stickers on you in clinic and do a, a quick recording and an echocardiogram. If all of those are normal, you're unlikely to have significant heart involvement. But if one of those comes back abnormal, we then recommend going on to more advanced diagnostic schemes, including a cardiac MRI or a PET scan. And that sort of depends on what your doctor's comfortable with and the resources that are available to them. But heart, heart involvement is very important. And so if you have sarcoidosis, it's important to talk to your main treating doctors about that. You know, what are the chances that you could have heart involvement? And then mention any symptoms, particularly palpitations where your heart is skipping around, feeling lightheaded, feeling like you might pass out. And of course, passing out, um, which the medical word for that is syncope. If you have any passing out spells, we always take those very seriously in our sarcoidosis patients. Awesome. Well, thank you for that uh, answer as well, Dr. Cronin. I'm going to um, um, kind of um, add to that question. Um, so you did mention a few of the specialty tests or exams that uh, can be performed to identify cardiac involvement. But is there any specific like blood work or uh, uh, something that you would work someone out with outside of, you know, an echocardiogram or something like that? So a preferred test like blood work type um, to determine whether someone has cardiac involvement or not. That's a, that's a really great question. And, you know, at this time, we really don't have any blood tests that can reliably tell us if there's heart involvement. There are some markers that sometimes go up in some patients, but in terms of really trying to figure it out, um, it takes multiple different tests. So we think the ECG electrocardiogram is very important to let us know if there's any electrical problems. Sometimes we also will do longer monitoring like culture monitors or event monitors. Echocardiograms are often performed in our patients uh, and that can be very important. There are features 
of cardiac involvement that you can see on echo, but the echo is not a perfect test. Sometimes the echo shows pretty normal function, but when we do more advanced tests, we can see the heart muscle better. So a sort of a simple way to think about it is um, that we get different but complementary information from the two main advanced imaging studies, cardiac MRI or magnetic resonance and PET scan. The MRI really takes beautiful pictures of the heart muscle and it can tell us how the heart is functioning and whether there's any scar tissue that has occurred from sarcoidosis. MRI can show other heart diseases, um, not just sarcoidosis, but with sarcoidosis, we tend to see patchy areas of scar tissue in different areas of the heart. So that tends to look at scar tissue. And we know that if you have a lot of scar tissue on MRI, you're higher risk for having rhythm problems and significant adverse outcomes from your sarcoidosis. The other major study that you may be asked to get is a PET scan. And this is often a, a challenging study. It's a two day study. And most centers will ask you to do a weird diet beforehand for 12 or 24 hours, depending on the center. They often ask you to do a low carb diet where you're eating bacon, eggs, hamburgers with no buns and hot dogs with no buns, and then maybe fasting before that. The main thing that we are trying to identify on the PET scan is inflammation, is active inflammation in the heart. And so once somebody has cardiac sarcoidosis, it is really the PET scan that we follow over time to see how the inflammation in the heart is doing. So once you get on medications, we may repeat the PET scan to see if the inflammation is improving or even going away altogether so we don't have any more inflammation in the heart. Thank you, Dr. Crone. That was uh, very informative. Uh, you know, got already seeing a lot of uh, comments here, uh, you know, very, very detailed uh, answer there. And a lot of people are appreciating the, uh, you know, the, the, the uniqueness in the way you deliver it. So please, yeah, both of you, please keep it up. Thank you very much. Um, all right, I'm gonna pass it back over to you, uh, Dr. Braverman. So um, um, have you seen improvement in patients who have severe inflammation in the spine due to sarcoidosis or what are the rates? Um, um, how does that occur? If you could just kind of expound on that a little bit, we'd appreciate it. Sure, so, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, there are sort of two, I mean, there's a lot here in this question. I think there are sort of two ways that we can talk about this. And I think one is sort of the topic of neurosarcoidosis and the other is kind of musculoskeletal manifestations and complications of sarcoidosis. Um, I think, you know, we tend to group neurosarcoidosis in the category of severe manifestations. Um, that includes cardiac, um, pulmonary and severe ocular complications as well, um, which can be, you know, vision threatening, and so that's, that's in one separate bucket and you would tailor your approach and how aggressive you are with immunosuppression based on how severe um, the inflammation is and how critical sort of the organ involvement and threat is. Um, and so, you know, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I think, um, you know, we were talking earlier about steroids um, and, and their role. And when you're talking about severe inflammation, we typically, you know, those are the times that we're reaching for steroids at high, you know, relatively high doses to try to get control quickly. And then we often typically, um, because of all of those side effects that we started to talk about during the first question um, that you asked me, Manny, like come along with steroids, not just the adrenal insufficiency, but risk of infection, diabetes. I think I um, saw, uh, you know, some allusion to that uh, in, in the chat as well. You know, again, there are a lot of side effects. And so if someone uh, is going to need prolonged immunosuppression uh, or, you know, has many comorbidities associated with steroid therapy, we're also thinking about steroid sparing agents, which we borrow a lot from, um, you know, in our experience as rheumatologists, at least with a variety of autoimmune and inflammatory diseases um, as the evidence basis in sarcoidosis is also being built up. Um, and we, we like to think about kind of the mechanisms by which all of these medications are acting. What are the key inflammatory signaling pathways that we're trying to target um, and be targeted in a way that makes sense with what's going on in sarcoidosis and what is dysregulated in the immune system. And so, um, you know, this is getting back to the original question about sort of spinal cord involvement. That would really be in the category of very severe 
um, you know, it's a very, very severe disease. And that would, you know, I think we, you know, sarcoidosis is a team sport. Uh, and that would certainly be an example of a time where you would certainly want to have neurologists involved, perhaps neurosurgeons, really to think about what's going on and how best to manage the situation and complications. Um, so that's one piece. And then there's a, you know, the other um, sort of uh, aspect, which is musculoskeletal involvement um, and thinking less about the spinal cord itself, but, you know, the axial skeleton, and that really means sort of in the center of the body can be involved in sarcoidosis as well as more appendicular or sort of out in the um, periphery of the skeleton. And so, um, you know, I'm happy to talk more about that, that, you know, much like sarcoidosis in general, which, you know, sort of is characterized by many, 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 many different ways it can show up patterns. Um, you know, there really is not one kind of sarcoidosis, even within just the musculoskeletal system, there are so many different radiologic, uh, sort of patterns that you can see, um, parts of the musculoskeletal system that can be affected. Um, whether we're talking about the muscles, uh, the supportive structures where the tendons insert um, onto the bones, the joints themselves, or the bones. Awesome. Well, thank you for that answer as well. Um, very detailed as well. We really appreciate it. Uh, you know, we're getting rave reviews as the comments are starting to come in. So please keep them coming. We really appreciate it. Um, and I will ask this question of both of you, um, one or both of you, please feel free to jump in. Um, a lot of times, you know, when patients go and get evaluated by their clinician, um, you know, sometimes the, the the communication aspect kind of gets in the way, you know, from speaking, you know, medical terminology versus, you know, the way that a patient can digest the information. Um, so if you could just quickly answer either one of you or both, what is systemic sarcoidosis? What does that mean? What is that definition um, for some of our audience members who are wondering that? Um, I'm happy to to start off the the conversation and then if Dr. Crone wants to add, but you know, I think um, you know, if you Google sarcoidosis or you look at you know different search engines, you'll see sort of invariably almost every paper or article will start out with sarcoidosis is uh, you know idiopathic. We don't know what causes it, multi-system granulomatous disease and the granulomas, um, you know, I think many of us are probably on this call are familiar with that, um, but that's the collection of the immune system cells and the white blood cells that are forming in different organs. And, you know, I think um, as Dr. Korn alluded to, we really think about the lungs as being heavily, you know, sort of that's the organ um, for many, many people uh, who have sarcoidosis that's involved, but really it, it you know, it's oftentimes multiple organs, multiple, because it's a system-wide disease. It's, there is immune dysregulation. And I think we still don't fully understand what drives that, but, you know, there are different thoughts that in, you know, oftentimes genetically predisposed individuals in response to some sort of environmental trigger, um, whether that is, you know, a occupational exposure or um, a medication, an infection, some, there's some trigger in the environment that then causes this immune dysregulation and these granulomas to form. Um, not everyone has the same burden of involvement in, you know, the number and severity in different organs. Um, you know, I think that there have been a variety of studies that have really tried to characterize what is the, the pattern of organ involvement um, and then you know, who has how many different organs involved and are there certain clinical syndromes where you tend to see clusters of certain organs involved together. Uh, so I think, you know, if you look at certain, I think, you know, the, um, you know, the NIH may have, you know, there was a working group that may say five or more systems is sort of this high risk multi-organ sarcoidosis. But I think that, you know, you, you definitely see when we say, you know, systemic, Oftentimes, you know, in rheumatology, that means one part of the body and then in another part of the body. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll pause there, but there's a lot more I could say on the, the talk. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's actually, you know, every person is different. I think that's what makes it so hard to treat sarcoidosis and to do research in this area is very difficult because one person may have heart and eye involvement and another person may really just have severe lung involvement and an occasional rash. So everybody's really different. And I think it's important for your doctors to be aware of sort of what are your most severe symptoms and organs involved. So usually when we see patients, we'll say, here's a patient with lung, heart, and eye sarcoid. 
here's a patient with neurosarcoid. And many times we'll find that one of the organ, one or two of the organ systems tends to drive the treatment. So we'll see some patients, for example, that have very severe lung symptoms, cough, or often on treatments for that. The heart is probably involved based on some imaging, but that's not the big problem. The heart's doing great, it's pumping well. And so I think it's important as a patient to know what organs we think it's involved in, what are you sort of your most severe symptoms coming from? And that often drives the treatment. I do think it's important to remember that it's systemic. So for example, I'm a, an electrical doctor of the heart, but I'm always talking to my patients, make sure you see your eye doctor once a year. Uh, we occasionally will see someone who's been treated by, you know, maybe their lung doctor for many years. Um, and maybe nobody ever really, they never had eye symptoms. And so no one ever said to get it checked out. So it is a weird disease that can affect many, many organ systems. And so it's good to remember that it's systemic, but I think that each individual patient uh, should know with their doctors, where's my sarcoidosis? What organs is it affecting? And then just to be aware so that if you get a really new symptom, you've never had a rash before, maybe it's sarcoid, maybe it's not, but there are just so many ways that sarcoidosis manifests that you should always be aware when something comes up, is it sarcoid, is it not sarcoid, or is it something related to my sarcoid treatments? Um, and so I, I think it's good to be aware that it's, a that it's a systemic illness, but most patients in my experience have one or two organs that are sort of driving their problems. It's unusual to have this severe thing where five organs are out of control all at the same time. Usually a person has one or two that are, that are causing most of their problems. Thank you both. That was great. And I'm going to toss this one right back to either one of you or both. But this is a question that comes up more often than not in a, the population. Um, so, you know, what I wouldn't say what is the treatment, but how do you go about treating or giving advice or tools or techniques for people who have de uh, debilitating fatigue as it is one of the symptoms that's more often um, with, with, with sarcoidosis? So um, either one of y'all, please feel free or both of y'all, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, I think that um, I think fatigue is one of the sort of um, aspects of sarcoidosis that really, really, really impacts patients' quality of life. And I think there are several others. Um, I, you know, looking at the chat, seeing some things coming up as well about small fiber neuropathy, sort of cognitive dysfunction, um, and together these are sort of grouped in this category of manifestations or complications of sarcoidosis that are called parasarcoidosis. They're not a direct result of the granulomas, um, but they are a sig you know, significant part of the disease for many, many people who have sarcoidosis. Um, and, you know, I think that again, you know, we're, we are, sarcoidosis is so complex um, and, you know, it can, as, as Dr. Crone was alluding to, you know, it's, it's not the same in any two individuals and the approach is often driven by, you know, what are the most severely affected organs? Um, you know, what are we most worried about in terms of damage? But then there's this other incredibly important piece of what is the quality of life, um, you know, that you're experiencing. And I think those are also being increasingly recognized in general in, in medicine as really critical outcome measures when we're studying treatments, you know, how, how are we really making meaningful differences in patients' lives? Um, and so I think, uh, you know, fatigue is, can be really debilitating. Um, and I think that, you know, if you try to look and, and get a sense of what the numbers are, it's really, you know, it's, it's very, very common and how severe that is absolutely varies. Uh, I think it's important, you know, to work with, your physicians. I think this is a sort of theme of what Dr. Kern and I both are, we'll be talking about a lot in this hour that, you know, that partnership between patients, between physicians, you know, family members, this interdisciplinary team, um, you know, with the patient at the center is really critical. And so if fatigue is a symptom, first of all, I think, you know, one thing that's very important to determine is, is there something else medical going on that could be driving the fatigue that is not the sarcoidosis? Uh, because, you know, you have to exclude other conditions. Uh, so I think that that's important and something medical unrelated to sarcoid or something medical related to the sarcoid treatment. The first question uh, you asked me, Manny, was about adrenal insufficiency. Fatigue can be an aspect of that. Um, and then, you know, in terms of approaches, uh, you know, I think that, uh, there is some evidence, um, around, you know, certain cognitive behavioral therapy approaches to managing with symptom burden. And I think that that is really particularly around fatigue. Um, and I think again, the 
multidisciplinary care team and getting support uh, for both you and for family members who are affected by your symptoms is really critical. And so, you know, as you're able to bring that in or your care team is able to sort of incorporate that, um, that, that that's one sort of evidence-based, um, you know, strategy that's been uh, studied. Another is kind of structured exercise programs um, and pulmonary rehabilitation programs, specifically with inspiratory muscle training. And I think that is important, again, that you're talking to your physicians who, depending on what your organ involvement is, you know, talking to your cardiologist, talking to your pulmonologist about embarking on one of these programs and ensuring that that makes sense for you. Um, but that has some data to support its use for sarcoid related fatigue. Um, and then there, you know, there is data and some, you know, practice around trial of stimulant medication. And again, that will be a discussion with your physician um, about whether that makes sense for you. Those are such great points. I'm, I'm so glad you made all of those. A few other things that I wanted to add. One point we often talk about in our clinic is um, that you can have fatigue with sarcoidosis even when your disease is well controlled. And so that's one thing that can be, although it's frustrating, can also be reassuring. If you're tired long-term, it does not mean that your sarcoidosis is out of control and not being treated properly. So, uh, sarcoidosis fatigue can, can be caused by one, one thing or many different things. It can be multifactorial. Um, as we talked about, it can be from other medical problems. Thyroid disease can make you feel tired. Obstructive sleep apnea that I just saw somebody mention in the chat is also very, very important. And one thing um, that can really cause fatigue is depression. It is very hard to wake up every day with a disease that makes you feel, you know, not feel your best and, and you're worried about it and worried about how you're doing. And so I think sort of the, the depression related to a chronic disease. And so that if you, you know, if you talk to your team and identify any features of depression, that's also something that should be treated uh, as well. Um, and, and so those are some of the important things. Um, I think about fatigue, but it is really hard. And a lot of our patients have it. The other thing is it can be a side effect from medications. For example, some of the heart medications that we use like beta blockers, we think they're so important for heart outcomes, but they can make people feel tired. Uh, so another thing that we talk about, and this is always tough to do, but um, you know, if you're at a, and you, you know, we hope that we can help patients feel better, but there will be times with your disease when you have limited energy to do all the things that you want to do. So I often will talk to my patients about waking up in the morning and trying to really pick the things that are most important that day. Uh, and often hopefully trying to prioritize the things that bring you joy, spending time with loved ones and, and friends, um, doing things that bring you joy, whether that's being outside or listening to music uh, and not really, you know, feeling like maybe you've spent your last bit of energy trying to you know, clean up the closet or do something that's maybe not as long-term important. So some of those things like planning your day carefully uh, acknowledging that you have a chronic disease that's difficult to manage. Um, I think that can be really important too. All great points. Thank you both for uh, that. Uh, all of those answers and all of those points. I think you hit it right on the head. You know, I think that wellness aspect goes into, you know, the, uh, you know, the patient outcomes and, you know, how you feel and how you, um, how you um, ultimately, you know, um, live with, uh, you know, a chronic disease, right? So thank you both for sharing. Um, I do want to uh, ask another question of you, Dr. Crone, um, as it just came across here. Um, after prednisone, you know, do you have any recommendations or, you know, based off of your guidelines or how you practice medicine, what, you know, what is the next best line of treatment for cardiac sar sarcoidosis after prednisone? That's a really great question. And one of the things that's been very difficult in the field of cardiac sarcoidosis and sarcoidosis in general is that we don't have great research. Um, patients with sarcoidosis are difficult to study for all of the reasons that we've been talking about today. It's a difficult disease to study. So the answer is that nobody really knows the answer to that question. I will tell you that because of the side effects of steroids, that are particularly harsh on the heart, diabetes, hypertension, weight gain, all that metabolic abnormalities that lead to increased risk of coronary disease, um, we think it's really important to get patients off steroids if possible. A little bit of it is user dependent. So we use a lot of methotrexate. I have a wonderful rheumatologist in our clinic that we work very closely with. So everything, I'm, all the information I'm giving you, I've learned from her. Um, so we use a lot of methotrexate. That's probably the most used medication after steroids in cardiac sarcoidosis. 
but we also we use other medications, including azathioprine and mycophenolate. And often, if patients are not doing well on their initial treatment, we will use infliximab, which is a TNF alpha blocker uh, that Dr. Braverman can tell you about. Now, I did talk about the lack of research, but I do want to tell you about a really important ongoing trial. This trial is called the CASM trial, and it's being led by a wonderful researcher from Ottawa, Dr. David Burney. Um, and this is a study that I've been lucky enough to be in the planning of for many, many years. And the study is open and enrolling. We're about halfway enrolled. This study is for patients with newly diagnosed cardiac sarcoidosis who haven't been on any treatment for their cardiac sarcoidosis. It is going to compare the first six months of treatment. Patients will be randomized to one of two treatments. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the trials, randomized means basically like the flip of a coin. So the trial determines which of two treatments you're going to get so that we can compare those two different treatments. One treatment is receiving steroids or prednisone for about six months. The other treatment is doing three months of decreasing steroids while getting methotrexate for six months. The rationale behind that is that methotrexate takes a couple months, two or three months to really kick in and start doing a job. So we didn't want to have patients not covered for those first few months. So the prednisone starts off in the beginning while the methotrexate's uh, doing its thing. We're going to compare outcomes, mostly PET scans. How are we doing with the inflammation? But there are so many other endpoints from the study that we care about. Quality of life, side effects from the medications, all of those adverse effect, uh, effects from steroids like blood pressure, diabetes. And so this study, which is probably going to come to completion over the next several years, is going to be one of our biggest, most important trials in cardiac sarcoidosis. And it's going to tell us when somebody comes to our office with new cardiac sarcoidosis and probably heart block or big rhythm problems, how do we treat them for the first six months? And so I think this is going to be really important data. I'm so excited that this trial is up and running. Um, and it's an international trial with centers from Canada, from the U.S., I think there's also European and Asian centers that are involved as well. Um, and so we're really uh, excited to have that and grateful to the patients that are participating or have already participated in that trial. Thank you. Thank you for all that information. Thanks for sharing that trial as well. That's uh, good information. So please, uh, if, if, if you're listening um, and you want to check that out, um, you know, uh, do you mind saying the name again, Dr. Crone, just so everybody it's can chasm. hear? It's CHASM. It's C H A S M randomized controlled trials. So if you want to read about it, you can go to clinicaltrials.gov um, and read about it, that trial and other trials as well. Um, of course, FSR has been such a great supporter of research, but you know, research is really the way that we're going to learn more so that in 10 years, we know more than we do today. Um, and so the future uh, for our patients is really doing research so that we can learn more over time. Love it. Thank you very much, Dr. Crone. Um, next question is for you, Dr. Braverman. Um, so um, patients who have pre-existing or have been diagnosed in the past with, you know, arthritis or, or something similar to that, um, um, is it, how, how do you differentiate the difference between, you know, sarcoidosis, joint pain, and or arthritis? Are they one and the same? Does sarcoidosis flare up your pre-existing arthritis? How do you help, what kind of advice would you give to patients who are dealing with having to try to possibly differentiate uh, the two? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as a rheumatologist, I see a lot of arthritis and in its most basic sort of definition, arthritis means a problem with the joint. And there can be a lot of different reasons that there are problems and there can be a lot of different ways that different joints are affected. Um, and so one, the most common kind of arthritis, you know, sort of, if you just look across the board is osteoarthritis, again, depending on certain age groups. Um, but in, you know, if we're not talking about young adults, osteoarthritis, which is more of a mechanical wearing down of the joint. Um, but then there is a whole category of arthritis, which is inflammatory arthritis that's related to immune dysregulation. Uh, I think probably one of the, the, the most common form of inflammatory arthritis that people are familiar with um, is rheumatoid arthritis. There are other forms of arthritis. There's arthritis that's associated with psoriasis. And then of course, uh, there's arthritis associated with sarcoid. So, you know, if we go back to, um, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier, Manny, about the different ways that sarcoid can affect the musculoskeletal system. So, you know, we can really um, 
sort of divide up the joint involvement in sarcoidosis to more acute arthritis, which we see in certain kind of clinical syndromes. Uh, the sort of most famous one is Lofgren syndrome, where you know you have the characteristic changes of sarcoidosis of the lymph nodes on the chest, on you know if you did an X-ray, and then a rash called erythema nodosum, which is the red bumps um, typically on the legs, sometimes fever, and then oftentimes there can be swelling really characteristically around the ankles. And that's a really acute form of arthritis. It tends to be more self-limited, meaning that those forms of arthritis can be supported often with um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like Motrin, ibuprofen, again, taking into account if that's a safe medication uh, for someone to take. And if needed, low to moderate doses of steroids for a period of time, and typically it goes away and doesn't come back. That's in contrast to more chronic uh, versions of arthropathy, or again, problem with a joint um, in sarcoid. And again, there can be different patterns that we see. So there can be, um, you know, a few joints involved, two to four, um, and that's a kind of similar uh, appearance that we might see in other kinds of inflammatory arthritis, like uh, psoriatic arthritis, for example. Um, there can also be involvement in the in the fingers, um, sort of multiple of the fingers, uh, and that that is more of the classic. You know, when we think about rheumatoid arthritis, I think there was a question about sort of how can you tell if something is rheumatoid arthritis versus sarcoid. Um, and I think again, we're really coming down to our exam, these kinds of arthritis can look different on the exam and on, you know, if we're getting x-rays, certain blood tests you might see in certain other forms of arthritis. Um, and, you know, but then at the end of the day, I think we are left with thinking about the symptoms and how do we treat that. And oftentimes there's a lot of overlap within rheumatology with, the, with different forms of arthritis and how they're treated. So we were talking about methotrexate um, in terms of cardiac sarcoidosis. And I know that that can be used in other, you know, in pulmonary sarcoidosis, we use it all the time in rheumatology. It's the, the cornerstone of many of our um, inflammatory arthritis treatments, not just sarcoid. So I think that we have to really customize and think about, you know, what, um, you know, what are the symptoms that someone's having and what are the mechanisms, you know, what do we think is going on with the immune system? And then what do we think is going to work? Um, and I think Typically by putting together, you know, what's the patient's story? Do we know they have sarcoid in other parts of their body? Um, and then are they, you know, do we see these patterns, uh, the different patterns of joint involvement that we can see in sarcoid and then the symptoms that they're telling us and then how, how can we best manage that? Thank you, Dr. Braverman. Um, now we do get this question often a lot and I'm gonna toss it out to both of you as you guys are specialists in different areas and different fields. So um, patients often ask, you know, um, medications usually, you know, have effectiveness at the beginning and maybe start to taper off or the effectiveness starts to kind of wear off over time and or it just takes a long time for the medication to kick in or it just doesn't affect uh, their symptoms specifically at all. So in those situations, um, how do you decide like or what kind of advice do you give to people when a medication that they're on or trying um, is is if they feel it's no longer uh, uh, impacting them and their treatment plan, um, at what point do they raise that awareness to to, to their clinician to uh, possibly start a different medication and or a different treatment regimen? I can I can start a little bit there and talk about um, cardiac sarcoidin treatments. So I will say that in general, um, once patients are on a stable dose of medications for the heart, many of our patients uh, do very well long-term. Uh, it's not very common to see patients who are doing well for a while and then all of a sudden fail through the medications. That said, over time, we do want to keep an eye on worsening inflammation in the heart. So we will periodically get usually PET scans or look for symptoms if the patient's having more evidence of palpitations. Then we might talk about whether or not um, if there's more inflammation on the PET scan, we need to either go up on the dosage or add another medication. Um, but it, in general, you know, for most of the medications, and Dr. Braverman will be able to speak to this much more than me, um, for most of the medications, we don't usually have a, a resistance developing or anything like that. 
The one exception I will say um, is that in plexumab, sometimes patients can develop antibodies to that. And so that's something that Dr. Braveman might be able to speak more to. If you're on infliximab or TNF alpha blocker like that, and all of a sudden you really feel like you're doing much worse, it may be something that your doctor should check for antibodies developing to that. Now, sometimes we check and there's, there are no antibodies and that's not the explanation, but it is something to be aware of that can cause that. But many of, um, many of the, method, the medications like methotrexate or azathioprine, they don't tend to lose their effectiveness over time. Um, so, but, you know, but everybody is individual and certainly that, that can happen. Yeah, I think I'll I'll add that, you know, it's always very important if you think that something is not quite right, whether it's new symptoms or you're concerned that the medication is no longer working, of course, always talk about that with whomever is managing that medication and, and other doctors on your team. Um, you know, again, figuring out, is there something else going on? Is it a side effect of a different medication? Is, again, it, has there been some resistance? And, and Dr. Crone alluded to, um, you know, really typically it comes up mostly um, when we're talking about the TNF alpha inhibitors, which are a class called biologics, which mean these are, these are medications that are proteins. They're similar to the proteins that our body makes, but they're not exactly the same thing that our body makes. And our immune system is designed to recognize things that are not made in our body. And sometimes um, there can be an immune response to that. Uh, and it's unclear, you know, you may have an immune response and it doesn't, you know, you may make antibodies against a medication. It doesn't mean the medication is not going to work anymore. So it's really hard to predict, um, even if you have antibodies, whether that means anything clinically. I think if you're checking the antibodies because you're concerned the medication's not working, um, you know, that's different from if you've checked on, you know, in everybody who are taking that medication. Um, so yeah, I think that this is just a matter of, you know, working with your doctor to figure out what, what's not right, because you know yourself the best and listen, you know, listen to that instinct. Thank you. Thank you both for, 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 for adding, um, um, your specific answers very, very uh, informational. Um, and I'm going to go back to you, Dr. Crone here. Um, you know, uh, you, you mentioned some imaging, you mentioned some um, some possible testing, you know, uh, an ECG, an EKG, possibly to diagnose cardiac sarcoidosis. But what is it that you're specifically looking for in these these types of tests? If it's imaging, what in the image are you kind of looking out for? Um, and, 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 you know, if you could expound on that, we, we greatly appreciate it. Sure. So I can try to run down the specific things that we care about. And I think one of the things that's challenging about sarcoidosis is we sort of collect data from all these different studies and then try to put it together to come up with, you know, what's going on in this patient. So it is a little bit like a mystery that each person has their own little puzzle pieces to put together. In terms of the electrocardiogram or the ECG, some of the findings that will suggest sarcoidosis are slow heart rates, uh, and that can be any form of heart block, meaning the electrical signal from the top chamber down to the bottom chamber can be slow. Um, and that can include bundle branch blocks, uh, which means that the electrical signal coming down the heart is not going down as fast on one side as the other. So the right or the left bundle branch of electrical signal may be going slow. Um, you can also see other rhythm problems like premature beats or skipped beats that can also be a sign of, of cardiac sarcoidosis. There are probably also some signs on the ECG that suggest lung involvement. So there are some ECG patterns that suggest pulmonary disease as well. And those are very specific findings that your doctor would need to look for. As I said, echocardiograms are helpful, but they're not perfect for diagnosing sarcoidosis. But some of the things that we can see on there is a weak heart muscle, either the left side of the heart being weak or the right side of the heart being weak. Um, you can have thinning of the heart walls and you can have aneurysms in the heart walls where there are sort of outpouchings of the heart wall uh, where the heart wall has become weak. One thing that can happen with a lot of different kinds of sarcoidosis is elevated pulmonary pressures, and that's called pulmonary hypertension. And sometimes we can see those changes on echocardiogram as well. The key finding, of course, we get lots of information from a cardiac MRI, but one of the most important findings that suggests sarcoidosis is looking at late gadolinium enhancement or delayed enhancement. So if anybody here has had a cardiac MRI, they give you some uh, contrast in your arm. It's not your typical contrast, it's gadolinium. 
And they do some phases on the MRI that looks for this gadolinium to show up in different areas of the heart. And what that looks like with sarcoidosis is patchy areas of gadolinium enhancement that suggests scar tissue. And the more you have these different areas of late enhancement, you can get more, you're at more at risk for rhythm problems in the heart. Um, and so that's really when we're talking about that, your doctor may say you have scar tissue, you have late enhancement, you have patchy areas. That's really what we're looking for on the MRI. The PET scan, we'll talk about it. You know, we have, we have all this doctor lingo, which many of you are probably picking up over time. What we're looking for on the PET scan is inflammation. And so we talk about areas of inflammation or FDG, fluorodeoxyglucose, but it is showing areas where the cells are very metabolically active because they are inflamed. And so again, sarcoidosis is a patchy disease. And what we'll see is different areas of inflammation in different parts of the heart. Um, and as we treat it, we look for those different areas of inflammation to resolve and then really go away over time. Once you have scar tissue at this point, we don't really have any great medications to treat scar tissue. So while we can reverse and treat inflammation, once you get sort of more permanent damage like scar tissue, we really don't have any great treatments to reverse that. And that's really true in most organ systems. That's true for the lungs too. Once you get advanced scarring in the lungs, it's very difficult to reverse that. Thank you, Dr. Crone. And I'm going to ask you the next question, Dr. Braverman, which is very similar, but we're going to focus more on the musculoskeletal and the joint systems. Um, so what is it that you look either through imaging or biomarkers or any specialty exams that you do uh, in your specialty to diagnose sarcoidosis? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think that, um, you know, in general, sort of the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, you know, is going to come from a compatible clinical, often imaging picture um, with typically a biopsy that shows the characteristic findings and we've excluded other causes. And that's kind of the pathway um, that somebody gets to a sarcoid diagnosis. And so, you know, it would be, you know, that, that um, you know, that assistance that you get from the biopsy, I think is, you know, is really important. Um, it, it's, you know, again, there are certain situations we talked about a little bit earlier where there is this constellation of symptoms that we really only see in sarcoid. So we mentioned the, the erythema nodosum, that rash, the changes on the x-ray with the lymph node um, inflammation and the swelling around the ankles. But uh, you know, that's, that's a, you know, that's a very small slice of the way that sarcoidosis can present and show up. And so it is really important to have, you know, some biopsy sample, um, you know, when it comes to, and, and I'll let Dr. Crone talk about this uh, more if she'd like to discuss, you know, I think uh, it can be challenging when, you know, sarcoidosis is really only detectable in one organ and the biopsy, you know, it's, it's hard to get a good biopsy. So isolated cardiac sarcoidosis, you know, there are some ways uh, that a cardiologist might work to make that diagnosis, but it can be more challenging. And again, um, you know, we're lucky to have our cardiologist here who can talk about that, but it, you know, without the biopsy. So back to your question, um, Manny, I think, you know, it would, it would be unusual to make a diagnosis of sarcoid arthritis without knowing that there is sarcoid somewhere else from a biopsy. That, that would be challenging um, unless, again, there are some other features that really clue us in. Um, and then the question of biomarkers, I think, is a broader and very interesting topic. You know, a biomarker really is any number of measurable indicators of disease status or activity. And I think, you know, an example of one that many people may be familiar with um, in diabetes, there's something called the hemoglobin A1C, and that can help us diagnose and also track how diabetes is doing because it gives a sense of what the blood sugars are like over a, a prolonged period. In sarcoidosis, uh, but again, a biomarker doesn't have to be just a blood test. Sometimes we can use imaging, and Dr. Crone talked about the, you know, the different um, ways they can do cardiac imaging, for example, to help uh, as a biomarker in a disease. 
So the role of biomarkers is less straightforward in sarcoidosis. There are a number of kind of candidate biomarkers that can be helpful information if we have them, but they are not um, good at sort of telling us, finding everyone. If, you know, we were to check this particular blood test, it's not, you know, not good at finding everybody who has sarcoidosis. Doesn't mean that everyone who has sarcoidosis would have an elevated or abnormal blood test. Um, and they're not only elevated in sarcoidosis. So there's a lot of, you know, sussing out. I think some of the, you know, biomarkers that many people may have heard about is, you know, the ACE, um, which is, you know, angiotensin converting enzyme, you know, that our body, you know, everybody has that in their body. It helps um, with blood pressure regulation, but it can be elevated in sarcoid because it's produced by one of the white blood cells um, in granulomas. But there are a lot of problems with relying just on the ACE uh, as sort of making a diagnosis or you know, using that to track how active the disease is. Um, there are some other biomarkers um, you know, that are of interest, but they're all somewhat problematic. So it would be very hard to make a diagnosis of sarcoidosis exclusively based on a blood test. Um, and again, specifically uh, with sarcoid, there are some very characteristic changes in the bones, for example, that you might see. But it's hard to um, distinguish some of those patterns with other things like, for example, certain malignancies may look that way as well. So it really is going to be that constellation of what is the what is the clinical picture? What does the imaging show us? Do we have a tissue biopsy? And have we excluded other causes like infection or malignancy? Thank you, Dr. Braverman. And we are at the 10 minute mark here. So thank you both, uh, first and foremost. But um, but before we close out and, and, and we get to uh, the closing statements here, we do want to offer you both an opportunity. So I'll start with you, Dr. Braverman, and then we'll pass it over to you, Dr. Crone. Uh, do you have anything you would like to leave the audience with? Um, we'll start with you, Dr. Braverman. Yeah, well, first, I, you know, I would just like to thank FSR and everyone who's here today um, who, you know, has put on this event and really I think that these are such you know important uh this is such an important community and I think it's really wonderful you know we've sort of figured out ways to connect virtually and across the country and I think that for you know for diseases and rare diseases that can also be really really critical to create a community um and so I I feel so privileged and honored to you know be a part of this tonight and um you know have loved being involved with FSR so I, you know, I would just really express gratitude to everyone and, and uh, you know, to all of the patients who have um, asked really thoughtful questions. And, you know, I think that this is why, you know, this is why we're here. Um, and yeah, so thank you. So I'd also like to say thank you. I'm so excited to be here tonight. And thank you to Manny for being a thank wonderful you. MC tonight. Uh, and to all the patients. Um, I also want to recognize that it's heart month. So February is heart month. Um, and I also did see a lot of questions coming by about diet and lifestyle changes. So remember that while you have a very unusual disease, sarcoidosis, something that's very commonly a risk for all of us is coronary disease and heart disease. So think about the basic things. We recommend you are not smoking, no forms of tobacco, no vaping exercising regularly. The American Heart Association rec uh, recommends trying to exercise 30 to 60 minutes a day, most days of the week. Now, if you're limited by joint pain or other things, that's okay. And we just want you to do the best that you can, but we do want you to get as much exercise as you can. And sometimes uh, doing exercises in a pool, like water walking or water aerobics can be very helpful for patients with joint disease. In terms of the diet, um, you know, you can certainly talk to your doctors about what diet is right for you. As a general recommendation, the one diet that's really been shown to have positive outcomes in terms of reducing heart attacks and strokes is the Mediterranean diet. And that involves um, lots of vegetables, lean meats like fish and chicken, uh, and lots of he healthy fats, things like olive oil and avocados, snacking on walnuts uh, and almonds, uh, and generally just trying to eliminate and minimize junk food and sodas that just provide empty calories. So we, it's very challenging when you have a chronic disease, but we also want you to do the, the best that you can to take care of your overall health um, and to, you know, to really take care of your body overall and your heart. 
Well, thank you both again. Um, we will, um, um, this is the portion where unfortunately we do have to say uh, goodbye to everyone. So I'm going to just share my screen really quick. Um, and we do want to just say uh, um, thank you. Thank you to both of you for your time. And thank you to all everyone in attendance for uh, attending today's session and for your insightful questions. And uh, once again, FSR would like to extend our sincerest gratitude to today's experts, Dr. Crone and Dr. Braverman. Um, if you're in the audience, I'm sure you're clapping along with me as well uh, for them sharing their time and their expertise with us um, through, um, and their knowledge and their valuable time, more importantly. Um, we would like to also thank you all for uh, joining our Ask the Experts event, and we hope that you feel more educated and more empowered. Um, as always, To this is the beginning of the year to make 2024 the best year yet, right? Um, as, as we should always, always be looking to improve ourselves and, and improve our community. And then lastly, we would like to acknowledge our sponsor for this event, ATIRE, uh, for their continued support of all of the uh, uh, research initiatives and uh, everything they do for FSR and the Global Sarcoidosis Clinic Alliance. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this. We hope that you uh, gathered as much as uh, possible from this session. And Please join us for our next one. Uh, please be on uh, on the lookout. We always have more educational content coming out throughout the year. Um, and once again, thank you, Dr. Crone. Thank you, Dr. Braverman. We hope each and every one of you have a blessed rest of your evening and a blessed rest of your year. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.